Welcome back to Final Fantasy IX. We're back in Dolly because we've crossed the gate that leads us there. Hooray! We're going to be picking up some things we didn't get to do before because it's disc two. Feels like forever since we last visited. Yeah, it's been like four weeks. Week. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're playing the game like as you go, it's probably only been like three hours. But still, you know. Ah, huh, well, when you think about, like, if you think outside the context of the game's really small world maps, traveling around on foot has to be pretty damn time-consuming. Well, it seemed like yesterday that Zidane shamelessly grabbed my ass. Oh, uh, well, at it least, it, at least it's, okay, well, hold, hold on, at least it's not like Dragon Quest V, where there's a day-night cycle as you walk over the overworld, so um, when you get to the point where you're traveling with your wife, your wife gets pregnant and has a kid over the course of, like, two weeks, so, like, I don't want to know what the gestation period in that universe is, but it's got to be goddamn ridiculous. So, <laughs> yeah. You want to know what freaks me out a little more to be a little more on topical of Final Fantasy? Yuna's hair between 10 and 10 2 gets obnoxiously long in less than a year's time. Or was it two years' time? Well, it, your, your hair can grow like a good eight inches in, over the You know, but it's you, like you Yuna's know. hair goes from shoulder length to down to her goddamn ankles in no, like a year's you time. No, you know what, I think, I, I, I always just sort of assumed that was a clip-on braid, sort of like what the Jedi have going on with their Padawans. Um, it's fake? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, Yuna's, uh, what, what I always liked about, now, like, you know, I, I, I very rarely give compliments to the design aspects of Final Fantasy X-2, but I always liked Yuna's default outfit, because it's such an obvious reference to Titus's costume. And nobody ever mentions this. They always just mention fan service, but if you actually look at the design she's dressing like titus <laughs> i got that as much as um uh bear in the ponytail the hair her hair is or the back of her hair yeah it's, it sort of like flares titus. out yeah it flares out like titus why didn't they have uh what's the lulu be the third playable girl instead of just making up a new because she's pregnant oh well uh, they, they, they made her pregnant to explain why she's not playable though <laughs> So. They wanted to have someone who wasn't tied down to a specific class, and I suppose they didn't... Well, you know what? I'm kind of glad they didn't use Lulu because of the dress sphere system. The fan service would have been 12 times as obnoxious with her. And it wasn't Not already... No, yeah, I, no, like, I, dis no, I disagree. Well, yeah, no, because... she, she, she has that way of carrying herself that's just really emphasizes her fan service elements, just the way her animations work. Pain as emo as she is doesn't do that. Okay, whatever. <laughs> it's just kind of a you know, I, I just I can tell I can tell they would have just gone that way. Also, Lulu has kind of a she kind of keeps to herself. Um She's a reserved. lot. Like even more so than than Pain did. It's weird to say that, because Pain is basically a female squall, but... I, w I, I agree that if Lulu was rocking dress fears like uh, Riku, Pain, and Yuna did in Ten Two, it would be... It, it would seem out of character. Yeah. But, uh... But come on, tell me you wouldn't want to see her in a Tom Berry outfit. Well, no, one of them was a Tonberry, one of them was a Moogle, one of them was a Cactar, I think. What would she have gotten? Oh, well, yeah, one of the things I like about Ten Two is that everyone has their own look for every class. So it's kind of like Final Fantasy V in that respect, where everyone had their own sprite for each class. right? And a lot of those sprites had different costume elements. For Like, like uh, Ferris's Thief looks a lot different than Reyna's Thief, or... Uh, I'm sorry, Lena's thief. Uh, or, Ganon ban, yeah. Lewis. Comple Ganon ban. <laughs> Completely different clothing set. Okay, where the hell did... Okay, uh, this is off topic. Where the hell did the term Ganon banning come from? Is there, like, some sort of Hyrulean message board that I don't know about or something? <laughs> like, who made who made Ganon the goddamn moderator also? I don't know what the origin of Ganon ban is. I know it stems from spelling out Ganon's name with two N's as opposed to one. <laughs> Oh, man. I think Marcus's thief, th thief, thieving counts toward thievery, by the way. It, it does. Oh, so that's why you don't actually want to kill him? <laughs> yeah. Also, stealing stuff. Woo! I can't explain it, but my thievery ability just got unexplainably stronger. Then Marcus just grins in the background. Oh, man. Why that's is he right here, though, anyway? Did we just, like, run into him by accident or something? Oh boy, it's time for a friendly creature. Excellent. 
Excellent. Which I think everybody at this point, this is the one I'm thinking about. Yeah, it's Casper. Wait, what? <laughs> the friendly ghost. <laughs> Did they actually name it Casper? No, I think that's what everybody else calls him, though. Well, I think his name is Ghost. Yeah, it is. A- and since he's a friendly ghost, uh, yeah. Everybody he... calls him Casper. <laughs> the original Casper stories were really dark, for the record. <laughs> Like, I think it was implied that Casper committed suicide or something. Yeah. Yeah, and he should have murdered children. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm exaggerating. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, but then they, made a, then they made a cartoon out of it. Then they made a semi-decent movie out of it. Then they made horrible movies out of it. And that's all anyone ever remembers anymore. Yeah. <laughs> the nice part about the friendly creatures is that they give you a ton of AP. Yeah, that's 10 AP, and he gives you... Uh, we gave you a high push. Yeah. yeah. So you said that okay. So that's your reward for getting each like a lot of APs. Your reward for getting each individual friendly creature. You said you guys said that there was a reward for getting all of them. Or mm-hmm. what? if you're going after Ozma. Oh, yeah. yeah. If, he, if he weakens he weakens Ozma. Well, what it does actually is it brings Ozma into melee attacking range. Yep. And it also negates his shadow. Uh, his shadow, his, Vulnerabil- his shadow, vulnerability, invulnerability. Yeah. yeah, so you can use the doomsday spell on him, which is a massive boon because you can in late game you can equip I- your entire party with uh, items that absorb doomsday. So it so it turns it turns from a, a spell that nukes everything, including your own party, to a spell that heals your party and deals massive damage to the enemy. And he's none the wiser. Yeah, so it's actually potentially the best spell in the series. Um. <laughs> Does the game tell you that you have to find all these friendly creatures to hurt Ozma? No. 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 Uh, there's there's probably some obscure clue somewhere, but, yeah. You know. The most you get is after you uh, take care of the friendly Yan, uh, he tells you now you can fight the round guy. Uh, <laughs> oh, that, yeah. Like, that's about it. Oh, okay. Well, I guess that the game... It's not like the game tells you that first, though, I guess. It's more the same. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the most you get is with... Um, the chocographs. Uh, well, you can read the little backstories behind each of the tablets, and they give you the hints that there's something in the sky. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, and you know the the friendly monsters themselves give you hints about the other friendly monsters, or specifically they give you hints about the next one in line. Um. Uh, so you know there are friendly creatures to find. Okay. So it's just you can be doing this this side quest without knowing that it affects another one. Which I guess is better than it just being arbitrarily linked for no reason and you just don't know about it at all. The fountain. And it's not like you don't get anything for it. Yeah. The fountain. Uh, Contrary to what you might be thinking, Steiner is not teabagging the cobblestones. He is, in fact, spamming the fountain with ten gil uh, each time. And if you do this a certain amount of times, you get a uh, a Zodiac coin. Yep. The Gemini Stelazio. Yeah, and the uh, Stelazio are um, a collectible item that you turn in for prizes to a certain person in Trino. There's a lot to do in Trino in particular. It's, it's probably my favorite town in the game. It has a jazzy theme, too. Uh, also, Gilgamesh shows up here a few times. Well, the running animation is similar to Garnet. <laughs> well, he needs to have a, a weird animation with his arms out wide because of his forearms. So... I mean, when you see a female character with their arms held out wide while they're running in in a video game, it's usually a cheapo way of compensating for their different body shape and animation. But, um... Oh, because they want to avoid clipping through armor uh, a lot of the time, is is what I really mean to say, because of the, the differences in body shape. Um... But, uh... But with Gilgamesh, it's actually because he has forearms. And when you have four arms, you got to imagine, like, having uh, one set of arms underneath another arm would be deeply, deeply uncomfortable. Yeah, poor Goro, man. Like, he puts up with some <laughs> really, really uncomfortable <laughs> shit. Don't let me get a start on Kotaro. Who? I like how Yo. there's there's a kid yeah. here named Mario. <laughs> Just... I love Treno for the music alone. That's all I need. I love this piano piece. And I like its aesthetics. Yeah, it's very calming. Yeah, uh, the towns the towns in this game have really great identities as far as their architecture goes, and that uh, that's um that makes me want to that actually slightly makes me want to remake of this game more because the game world looks like it should have like really defined world building, but it doesn't. 
like, there was probably a lot of writing put into just the art design in this game. But you don't really get any of the actual writing behind it. Trina was I, just that town with the with the, with, with, with the auction house in it. <laughs> it's one yep. of the benefits when you purposefully try not to reinvent the wheel with your franchise. You're able to focus on what does work. Cotton road trick. <laughs> oh, here we go. Wait, so you bought... You wanna explain the uh, cotton road trick, right? If you get 99... You can get a wrist and, a believe, a steepled hat. You can send those into the cotton robe. Cotton robes are worth more than the steepled hat and uh, wrist plus the synthing combined, so you gain money by doing this. So this is basically a really bastardized version of crafting to, yeah. to make money. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Except someone else is fronting the labor for you. He's exploiting the cotton rope stock market, you son of a bitch. Hey, it works. The price never goes down. <laughs> oh, man. A lot more balanced than an MMORPG where the prices for everything crafted are astronomical, uh, but uh, but you you can never sell anything to an NPC for more than like one gold piece. Ah <laughs> oh, man, better find Super Saw fast. I like how there is literally a plot item called Super Soft. <laughs> yeah, regular just... soft is not going to work. What about Super Soft? <laughs> it's like th that's the the least fantasy name for an item ever. <laughs> it's kind of like something that, like, they might name toilet paper in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> so in America we always call it Charmin, I guess? No, like, I imagine it being like... A, <laughs> this a, toilet paper is not enough for one wipe. No, I need Super Charmin. It, it would be like a cheap store brand of toilet paper. <laughs> you know? There are also a lot of ATEs in Trino, if you haven't noticed. Yes. Like, a lot of ATEs. And if you, wanted just... that if you wanted that power belt I got from Gilgamesh, you have to do the ATEs in that certain order, so... Oh, yeah. yeah oh, I forgot the that. That's kind, of, that's kind of silly, but yeah, you do need to do the ATEs in a specific order for certain things. It's like how you need to do the AT in order to get the Kubo Nut with BB. Yeah, yep. exactly. So. Yeah, but in this case, it's a certain order. Otherwise, Garnet just doesn't get her money back. Yeah, which I suppose is supposed to um, is supposed to represent her not um, you know being fast enough on the draw, catching up to the pickpocket. But it would be really weird, weird if you could do or events out of order, where yeah. Gilgamesh actually puts money back in the Garnet's pocket. Yeah, it's just a little guy, dang it, figuring that out is all. Uh, you can get your lightning staffs, and ice staffs, and flame staffs here if you couldn't steal them from. Uh, black mage. Yeah, and you might be thinking, just out of sheer RPG reflex, what's the point of all these different weapons for the mages? We're never going to use them. Well, in this game, they get you different spells. Yep. yep. So you actually Learn have to upgrade their weapons and shit. Yeah. Uh, well, if not upgrade, then change them around. Well, in, in most RPGs, uh, a mage's staff actually affects their magic stat. But these um, weapons are equal in terms of stats. They just have different spells attached to them. Yeah. Well, it's good for a change of scenery. Also, you might be wondering about those rising suns. Well, stockpile those things like a motherfucker. Because um, once you get amaranth, those are your throwing weapons. And yeah, you can just throw regular weapons, sure. But there are specific items that are used with a throw ability and only with a throw ability. And they're actually both more economical and more effective. Sorry, sorry, can't afford it. Do I now? Oh, I have 98 <laughs> cotton robes. robes. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. right this way, sir. Yeah, I and, went up from 6 kill to 190,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, up until really late game when you have thievery and stuff, having Amaret in your party to toss throw items all the time is a really handy thing. Because he, he does a lot of damage with those things. Oh, uh, the fucking auction house. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's actually a trick that you need to um yeah that you I, need show to be often, I show it once and then we cut past yeah I'll, I'll explain it just really quick uh to win at the auction house only ever auction a very small amount as small amount as possible over the last bid because no if you there's, try... there's, an, there's an even easier trick no. well let, 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 let me hear Lois explanation well right sure. if you try doing a really big big bid right away you'll um the the, uh, the person coming after you will just bid higher than you no matter what. Um, if you bid smaller, 
uh, after every small bid that they make, eventually they'll get too intimidated to outbid you. And that's how- that's the basic way to win at the auction house. Well, my method is sniping. <laughs> <laughs> the, the auction house guy says a certain thing, and then that's when you know he's about to end the auction, so then you just go in and snipe. Yeah. <laughs> a certain line of dialogue. So yeah. wait, so you just don't bid at all, and then you snipe at the yeah, last second? I, I, Yep. You goddamn eBay dick. <laughs> yeah, but if if, if, if you, it, it, it works. If you do it this way, though, you also keep the price down. True. But if you did the cotton rope trick, you don't have to worry about money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you you do want to go to the off auction house fairly frequently because not only are there unique um, key items to buy there that I think factor into some other side quest later, but there are some really good um, accessories and stuff that you can get there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, also some ring, Gemini coins. Also some. Uh, I think a few Stelazio are there too. Uh, uh, no, I don't believe not. I don't believe no, so. I believe not. No, but you can get a Medane's ring, fairy earrings, pearl rogues, uh, reflect rings, a uh, pearl rouge. I'm sorry. And um, you can also get, you know, little knickknacks like mini Sid, Un's mirror, Doga's artifact. Uh, yeah, it's which you get, all of which, which are you, which you, just which basically then... there to be references to previous games. <laughs> yeah. What do they do? Which like... you then, which we can sell them back to nobles for double the price. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that too. And uh, then you, I, and then I had a heart attack. And then you can rebid on them. <laughs> yeah, I had a heart attack when I saw the rat's tail up for sale, and I was like, oh shit, is there adamantite in this game? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. The rat's tail is a reference to Final Fantasy 1, uh, just in case people uh, aren't aware of this, because it is fairly obscure being that far back, but you... Well, no, it was, it was also in Final Fantasy 4. Well, the, the rat's oh, tail wow. in Final Fantasy 1 was what allowed you to upgrade your classes, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah you grow you up. Did, you did the rat's tail quest for uh, for King Bahamut, and um, and they and he would promote your classes. And mm, This is a good rat tail. And in Final Fantasy 4, you had to fight the pink puffs for that goddamn thing, was it? No, the rat tail is what you get in the Cave of the Summons. 